Hello, uh, my name is Ian Glover. Um, I would, I've been the program manager for the work we're doing with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, looking at uh, financial inclusion for the poor. Um, I believe this is a really important project and, and what they're trying to do and what they're attempting to do is to encourage more of what they would class as traditionally unbanked individuals um, into the more disruptive financial services markets. And um, that's very important because in their context, what they're saying is that if you want to raise somebody out of poverty, you have to provide them access to financial services. And there's lots of things that, that you need to do and you need to put in place to, to facilitate that happening. Obviously, you need the devices themselves. Uh, you need easy to use applications. You need the communications into those sorts of areas as well. Uh, but most importantly, I believe, is, is sort of a softer element, which is trust. And I think in these sorts of areas, uh, trust is very hard won and it's very easily lost. So therefore, any problems we have in association with, with cybercrime activity in those sort of local communities um, would, we believe, have a major detrimental effect in terms of the rollout of these types of programs to encourage more people uh, to utilise the services. Um, we looked at the start of the project, at the, the types of security awareness programs that have been utilised and whether or not they'd be fit for the marketplaces in, in Asia and Africa that, that we wanted to, to, to move into. Um, my view at that point was that, that whilst there is some successes in terms of, of traditional security awareness programs, um, I think in this particular marketplace, it would be really worthwhile just experimenting to see if there's different ways of doing things. In many of the countries that we, we, we did the research in, uh, there was certainly a distrust of government, there was certainly a distrust of authority and, and dictatorial type messaging in terms of telling people what to do uh, was, was not going to be well received. You, you could argue that would be a similar situation in the West and, and I think maybe that's why some of the existing security awareness programmes maybe haven't had the, the level of impact that, um, that, that they might have perceived uh, was possible. Um, but what we wanted to do was to, to try to look at a different way, trying to look at how the communities could communicate with each other, um, how we could get trust into the environment, and most importantly, how we could use sort of digital media in a much more effective way than we've done in the past. So rather than having posters on trains or having posters in major areas, and what we wanted to do is to try and reach people where they're actually using the technology and to try to think about how we can actually influence them to, to think that it's their idea and think that it's it's part of their responsibility uh, to make sure that they were taking um, cyber crime related activities in, in an effective way. I'd now like to introduce um, Greg Oldfield. Um, I contacted Greg because uh, he runs a, a digital media organisation, not necessarily in, in cyber security. And I think that to me was a very important element of it. But I wanted to look outside of our normal um, areas of, of expertise and try to draw in some of the some of the work that has been done by other people in terms of trying to influence communities. So Greg, I wonder if you could just introduce yourself and, and, and introduce uh, Engage. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, I'm Greg Oldfield, the uh, CEO and founder of Engage Digital Partners. We've been uh, in the business and marketplace now for 10 years. Um, and be before that, I was with a traditional media business. Um, but knew that the, in the last 10 to 15 years, the focus has really, really shifted now to, to digital platforms. So everything we do is digital first. Uh, and that really means that we're talking almost on a sort of one-to-one -one direct com communication with our, with our audiences. And we work not in the uh, finance sector, uh, but we work in the sport and game industry. Um, we manage somewhere in between uh, sort of four to 500 million fans or communities. And our real focus is, is how do you build uh, communities that have a huge passion and following for all of their sports or their or their games that, that, that they follow. And we do this almost on a sort of daily basis. And so but the focus really here is, is about how do you build communities? Um, and we have four main pillars of the things that we do. So we normally inform, we educate, we entertain and then we convert or we try and get some sort of full form of call to action. But the main thing here is, is about how do you spend time with all of these people on the digital platforms? They're spending, I'd say, the majority of their day now um, on one or, one or many of di the various di di different digital platforms. So the key here is about the community almost uh, has, has this whole value of trust, which is what Ian mentioned a little bit earlier on. And that is one of the most important things, the whole thing of trust, 
the influence that, that, that people have and, and their sort of sense of belonging, but also the authenticity. So if people hear things from their own community, they're more likely to believe that as we as we do things like storytelling, we bring fans closer to their particular leagues or particular clubs. And the area of gaming is really, really important as well. There are more and more platforms that have developed over the last couple of years. One of those is Discord, uh, and that's a very specific gaming platform. But that is almost uh, its own community, uh, and everyone almost has to be invited in, and you have to feel that they are part of the same community. So trust is the most important thing. If you if you fall if you fall away from the values, you will be expelled from the community. So the digital communities today, there are multiple, and more and more of them continue to grow. Uh, it's really about making sure you have that trust. Um, and again, we just try and find new audiences and bring new people into communities, but that's really our, our focus as a business. Thank you, Greg. I mean, one of the one of the first things that uh, that you mentioned in the work that you've done for us is, is about strategic planning and, and really trying to, to reach the right audience in the right place and, and making sure that you are influencing their habits. Um, that, that initial planning activity and understanding how the particular marketplaces uh, operate, do you think we can do that on a global basis or do you think that has to be more regionalised or, or brought down to a community level? Uh, I think depending on the, on the sort of uh, objectives or the key uh, sort of performance indicators of what you're trying to achieve uh, will depend whether or not you need to go globally or regionally or e even locally. I think we for example, some of our clients, uh, we will work with them on a global basis. But then if we're delivering certain messages like into India or subcontinent, we will probably customize that message. So you will have a localization element, even to a global plan. But we do find when we've worked in uh, local markets, so we work for quite a lot of our sports franchises, specifically in India and subcontinent. So we're localizing that in sort of four or five regional languages. And we're doing specific campaigns for that audience because they will build far closer and have far more of an engagement if you customize it and talk to them in their language uh, using things even things down to like the, like the colors or the customary uh, different changes in in the vernacular which shows that you actually have taken the care and attention to really customize and you fit they feel that you are uh, really spending time understanding their culture their issues uh, rather than just being a very big global uh, property. So I, 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 I would say globally works. It's um, the key thing for us, though, is when we talked about this strategic planning process, everything comes back to the data. So we use a huge amount of data insights to understand the audiences and um, understand what messages you're trying to achieve. Where do where do these people spend a lot of their time? What are the right intervention strategies? So you can build this globally or you can build it regionally or locally. So I'd say we have the tool set to be able to understand what you need to do to make things work and get the best cut through. Um, so I'd say that's 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 probably a conversation that you have to have with each individual or each individual initiative that you want to to, to deploy really. Yeah. So, so you also talked about some of the data insights and some of the platforms. Um, in terms of looking at um, some of the countries that, that you did some initial evaluation on, we, we had Pakistan, uh, we had East Africa and we had the UK. Um, do we have to carefully consider what the platforms and what the most appropriate delivery mechanisms are? Or again, can we just do this by just picking one horse and, and re really making it run? So yeah, to answer your question on the sort of specific markets, uh, we looked at, I think, both Pakistan and uh, African markets. Uh, but they're very, very different. Pakistan, uh, again, most of these markets are almost uh, very very similar. India is exactly the same. They're, they're almost their adoption of technology has accelerated over over the past sort of 15 20 years, and they're much more sort of mobile centric now, and are much more engaging in sort of the new the new media or digital media. Um, so I would say that you'd, you'd still need to customise your uh, communication on on the platforms which are most prominent in those markets. So look, Facebook uh, and YouTube. Uh, TikTok is growing in, in, in certainly in Pakistan. That's a very, very big marketplace. So there are certain platforms where we, we would necessarily we'd sort of almost be drawn to see exactly where the audiences are and you build campaigns around those particular platforms. Um, if you looked in the case of um, Ethiopia, for example, again, that's predominantly still Facebook. Um, and again, still mobile centric. Half of the population is, is on a mobile uh, phone now. Um, but again, sort of Instagram is still growing there as well. So again, different platforms for different marketplaces and some markets also have 
their own uh, sort of unique platforms. Again, in certain markets, you'd need to consider those just to make sure you're talking to them in the right platforms at the right time of the day. So it's all about making sure you're talking to the community contextually with the right intervention at the right time on the right platform. So there's so many things or variables that you have to put into that strategic plan. So going back to that first question you asked, it is all about the strategic planning. And we have sort of five pillars of how we approach that from data, finding audiences, the right message on the right platform and the right time. And so really, it's just really making sure that you, you apply those processes to whichever community and whichever campaign that you're that you're building and uh, deploying. So you used a really nice triple there, there Greg. Um, but in your presentation, you also talk about the importance of, of sort of using slogans and things. Um, did you think that in uh, in the security market that that's something we should we should really concentrate on to try to get some some key messages and and what does good look like in that sort of definition of a slogan the environment? Yeah, and I think. Uh, the, the key thing is you've got to get people's attention. Um, so in, in the old advertising world or using traditional media, it is about creating awareness. But I think today, in today's marketplace, people are, I think, you know, more than ever, uh, that sort of cut through or, or, or trying to find something that in, is instantly recognizable, cuts above the noise, something that will stand out um, and be sort of re recognized is, is the most important thing. So we spend a lot of time almost looking at how exactly, especially at the time of year as well that you serve it. So again, when you're when you're working in some of these key markets, certainly from a sport and gaming point of view, which we sort of consider it follows a calendar. So again, you, you can choose the main moments for us around our event, but you, you shouldn't do something if there's a major election going on, et cetera, because that will literally, you know, your, your, your property or our, our sort of fan base and community that we manage will be dwarfed um, and you'll get no cut through. So timing is really, really important, but in terms of overarching messages, yeah, I think it's three things really. It has to be simple it has to, and memorable. That's number one. So very short, very snappy, something that's relatable or it's either got a hashtag that, again, hashtags have been very well sort of used over the last couple of years. It's very good for tagging when you're doing all the tracking. Uh, sometimes you need to use uh, icons. So using uh, heavily iconized, again, it's very visual media today. Um, people buy with their eyes or, or, or sort of that's the way, first way you engage and that's why a video is becoming much more prominent and um, and then the last one is you know adapted by region so again you can still sometimes use as you mentioned before like these global you come up with a global initiative and um, the simple the memorable and um, having iconography in, in your in your campaigns and then you can localize it sometimes by colors sometimes by using different um, protagonists within it or different influences that bring it to life locally in each different market. So again, you can plan these things to to do that. But yeah, you're right. The, the overlying message is you need to make sure you have a very big standout message. But also consider all of the noise and the other variables that will, may, may be happening at the same time and make sure you, get, you give yourselves the best chance to be heard and for your message to be engaged with by the community. So. Thanks, Rick. Um, one of the other things that I really liked about the, the presentation that, that you've made for us is, is, is the discussion on influencers. And I just wonder what type of people these are and whether or not we can identify influencers that that would both address the sort of community needs, but but also have, have enough gravitas to, to sort of reach a, reach a mass market. So, so I just wonder what the role of the influencer is and, and what type of individuals they, they might be. Yeah, that's a good, good, good question on the sort of influences. The, the, the role they play, I think, is a very big one, especially in the market that you're trying to, to almost educate and try and build awareness on. Um, so I, I think that whole thing back to that trust and authenticity is really, really important in this particular uh, sector that you're that you're looking at and this whole unbanked uh, audience that you are trying to address. So if we're doing campaigns in sport or gaming, sometimes we won't, you know, we either use macro or what we call micro influencers. Uh, so macro or big, big names, sort of ambassadors in, in sport or gaming, you know, everybody will know <clears throat> about, about these, these, these particular people. Um, so sometimes, sometimes it's good to have, when you talked about your global campaign, you may have large macro influencers where people, they resonate with, with many people on, uh, at diff, uh, you know, in different markets and different levels. But again, when we've got into these specific uh, regions, I think you need a sort of macro, uh, so you, sorry, a micro influencer. So using very, very distinct people, almost if you were to subdivide your 
community in terms of the different demographics if you were looking at female you know which which people will influence different people that are at different life stages and therefore that's the piece where they they actually have some engagement um, and feel that they they relate to the person that they're seeing talking about a message or, or asking them to get involved or listen to a story or um, engage with some sort of hashtag or take some sort of call to action so the key thing again is go back to the data we use our, our data tools to almost do identification so again understanding what you're trying to achieve which audiences which demographics and we will go and find the influencers um, at the local level to find out who those people are and they can be from different walks of life I think we were looking at you know when we did this did the, a short survey which everyone will see in the presentation we pulled people from journalists maybe politicians rights lawyers so people almost in authority that they will listen to rather than just having you know a, like a propaganda or, or seem to be coming from a government these people are massively influential and if they've got different sort of different credibility but from different parts of parts of the community sometimes that message when it's compounded they might hear it once but if they hear it from somebody else or see it from somebody else also they respect they're more likely to engage so the data tells you who and then you just need to make sure you get the right messaging and build the right story and narrative arc to make sure that you are serving and you almost keep hitting that audience yeah, but those influences are really really important so so do you believe in sort of the concept of having sort of local influences? So, so if we've got people that are regularly contributing to, to discussion and, and are raising their profile within the community, do, do you think we should also utilise that type of individual as well? Yeah, and I think there's a, a new a new sort of word that's uh, sort of cropped up over the last sort of two years, really, driven more by sort of YouTube and, and Google, uh, which is the whole area of sort of creator creators. So in a way, influencers before were almost paid to almost promote a product or promote something um, and that's definitely changed now to people becoming almost creators again in the community and there are more and more rewards for those people to do that now where they are you know effectively getting involved creating their own content and maybe doing their own podcast maybe doing their own little digital series and in a way you almost want those people to to embrace it and come in and then let them have a voice in their community and the, the more people that you can encourage that aren't just influencers but can become or sort of influencer stroke creator roles they're the ones that have the most impact because they do want to express their own opinions maybe their own life stories which again people are going to relate to if someone's been through one of the issues that you've mentioned about sort of getting onto financial services or they've been hacked or something's happened to them they can tell their story and by imparting their story to the community and having a regular feature of getting other people in to come in and talk about their experiences that's the way that it gives it much more again it's back to this thing about trust and authenticity people will believe that far more than centralized or very large campaigns that again sometimes only end up being in short bursts the key thing we talked about when we were looking at this project with you was about sustainable sort of communication and this is the way to do that you need to almost embrace the community and the creators and influencers within it for them to own it it's a bit like back to that discord thing i talked about earlier they need to almost help give you almost create the enablement platform for those people to then become your your voices uh, your multiple voices to help more and more people understand the messaging that you're trying to get across what are the issues what are the pitfalls how to make people make sure they don't make those mistakes or they, they go through the steps or processes how do you get more of the, more of the messaging across done by the communities far more powerful than you keep throwing like broadcast messages at people and um, the sustainable piece is to do it small and often and have more and more sort of people telling those stories within the community yeah i really feel that, that we should do a little bit more more research look, looking at the the creator community to see how we can utilize it so certainly as part of the project, we, we try to work with the Haymarket Theatre to, to try to bring theatre and try to, to bring the messages in, in a different way. But, but the interesting thing about making the films and actually doing that type of work with, with them was it was actually the discussion at a local level. It, it, was the, it was the young people coming and talking about their experiences. 
and and I felt that was much stronger than than the approach that we actually took, which was we try to think what the key messages are, and then we try to orchestrate them to discuss it. Uh, in actual fact, the sort of free flowing discussion and and their experience and their understanding or lack of understanding of why it's important, I, I felt was was much stronger. So so I really think that there is some more research in that area that I think we should do. Um, yeah. One of the other difficult I think we've got is 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 how do we actually go forward with the with the activation? You know, it, it's all very well to have fabulous content. That there is really good content in in lots of different places, but but how do we actually go move forward with with this actuation? And how do we do it at scale, or do we do it locally and then build up, or do we actually try to address the whole thing um, as as a massive launch? What, what what's your opinion on activation? Well, again, it's again back back to the original sort of uh, what are the key milestones or the key objectives you want to achieve? Is it you know, and do you do something globally? My my view again again you can do both global and regional, or even if you want to call it localized. But the, probably the best way to do it from a process point of view is to almost do A and B testing. So again, go and do something which gives you almost like a case study or a number of different case studies, and you see what works. But you can do Digitally, you can do these things far more cost efficiency, efficiently. You can take a lot more control. Um, you know, if you're doing a campaign, we do lots of A, B, C testing for clients all the time. Um, if you were doing a traditional media campaign, you'd have to create the create the branding. Maybe if you're doing traditional outdoor, lots of different media, you'd have to do the media buying. You are pretty much committed, and you let that campaign run. And it's very, very difficult to measure that sort of the cost effectiveness or the ROI you get from those types of campaigns. Digital platforms allow you to stop, start, and what we sort of we sort of stop, start, refine, continue. And you can do A and B testing all the time, and that's what we find most effective. And then you will learn from each of those. Um, and sometimes things will happen, which we found, you know, you try and put two or three different interventions in, you think, you know, number one's gonna work better than two and three, but most times you'll be surprised in terms of how people react um, depending on on how you've sort of de deployed that campaign and you just learn from maybe three did better than one so you stop one you take the best you know, elements and you continue with three so I, th I think that whole a and b testing is something that you should definitely consider and then about how you then how you build that and roll that up to sort of more regional and and that will almost influence your global initiatives as well but digital digital is, is the best way to do that uh, for sure. So, so you, you mentioned metrics in there. I, I think historically we've been really bad in our community about trying to to measure the the success of awareness programs as, and other, and other forms of cyber security. The the more questions we ask and the more we raise the profile, it's the more information we get back, which makes things look like they're getting worse. Um, so, so for this type of an awareness program, then then what type of metrics should should we try to do? consider and, and and should we again refine those over time so to make sure they're actually fit for purpose yeah i think the, the key thing on everything that we do again it comes back to the data so almost data is that is the thing that is constant through throughout what we're doing here and the sort of insights that we, we we use so it's the same thing at the end you're using your data insights and your metrics but in, in on the digital platforms yes you can measure uh Pretty much every, anything on everything. So whether you're measuring awareness based on impressions or click-throughs, um, if you're pushing people from like social platforms to a particular website or a microsite, you're trying to capture information. So all of those things are built in the in the strategic planning piece we put at the beginning. So you need to define at the beginning exactly how you're going to run the campaign and how you're going to measure it, and then that really dictates how you how you how you deploy them. But I would say yeah, you can define the criteria there's a lot more data available uh, so you know exactly how many how many people uh, the biggest thing in, in this campaign that you'll run is things like sentiment so again you know and then and the affinities so you know you, when you're identifying the audiences is are there close affinities between target audience and the people you're finding like you talked about the influencers or creators so there's relevance but then when you're communicating that message you want to see what's the sort of sentiment and the interaction but there are different tools that we have available in our sort of tool set that allow us to to me measure all of these different attributes, uh, which give you a much better indication of what's working, what's not. And then because you can deploy start and stop, you can be more effective in terms of making sure you don't keep doing something that's not getting any results. You stop that and you continue the things that do. So you are almost measuring your 
your performance and your uh, success effectively in terms of how you're communicating your message or your call to action, but also controlling your cost and spend by not doing the things that don't work. Okay, I completely agree with the sentiment idea. I, I, I really strongly believe that, uh, that again, you can tell people to do things over and over again, but if they're if they're not receptive to actually listening to that message or, or understand how it relates to them, then, yeah. then we we don't make good progress. So so I I strongly believe that that concept of trying to measure sentiment and using the data to do that I, I think is is part of the part of the big solution really. Yeah. I mean, just just your opinion. I I I invited you into the project. It it took a little bit of persuasion because because we had to explain what on earth we were doing, talking to a sports media organisation about computer security and and dig, digital digital safety. Um, mm -hmm. in, in your opinion, do do you actually think that 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 we could address the the security awareness market using the types of tools and techniques that you've been discussing or 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 were we completely off beam in terms of coming to talk to you in the first place no again good question though was was it something that we were uh, sort of had any in market knowledge of? and in in many ways uh having sort of no knowledge of your sector it's quite an interesting because the same issues that you're raising here uh, exist in many different sectors and in very, very very many different sort of marketplaces so I think what we've learned you know we started in sport we're now in esports we're in gaming we're moving into web 3 so we're moving into lots of different the main thing is I think what we have in terms of the tools and the, and the digital approach would work in your marketplace because everyone asks for awareness interest you're trying to drive people to a particular point to convey a message and then you want them to take some call to action and you want to either change behavior or you want them to do something different at the end of it that's exactly what we do in any one of our communities so i'd, I'd say the the questions you're asking are no different the nuances of what you know and the knowledge and the se sort of sex sector expertise that you have is what you need to sort of uh, get us to understand a little bit more but again using the tools you can guide us in terms of which are the sort of audiences you may have done other things in the past. So all that historical knowledge um, will help guide the tools that we have, but to deploy them in your marketplace, I think if you, you know, one of the things you probably could do is to do one of these tests or, or, to, or A or B testing in some of these particular markets, and then you can prove that this approach would work. But I think digital is definitely the right way to go. It is much, much more uh, focused, um, and it's where most people are spending the majority of their time is on digital platforms and they're also because they're in a community they are influenced by others in the community they're not necessarily influenced as much by government or politics in terms of where it is today in, in the marketplace and how how people are communicating it's still the broadcast to many and that has that ship has sailed a long time ago brilliant I, I think at that point greg we'll, we'll sort of call it a day um i i thought it's a really interesting piece of work you did for for us and, and certainly I, I think there's a really good opportunity to, to as you say actually go and test this to see whether or not we can utilize key messages strategic views use influencers to try to get those messages out and, and really importantly I think build that sort of concept of, of community creators that, that would actually help push those messages out into the local community so so if there is something we can do together in the future to, to work on that then then I'd really like to um, but in the meantime, there is a there is a really good presentation that, that we've we've made, really based on some of the discussions that, that Greg and I have had today, and, and you can download that. Um, Debbie will describe where that is and how you can find it um, later on in this at the back end of this presentation. Um, but at that point, I think it was a really interesting piece of work, Greg. I think it looked at the issue of security awareness in a very different way than we've done historically, uh, and in my view. The, the use of community and the use of influence is the, is the way to actually start to get these messages out. I think there there is this bolt on opportunity as well that, that we can actually change people's perception of what cyber security actually is about because what we want to do is prevent people going into this type of industry and we, we want to make the people that, that are actually attacking individuals and we want them to feel as though they are not accepted in society. And I think that role of community is not only just raising awareness of how to protect yourself, but it's also saying to the communities that, that this type of activity is not acceptable within the marketplaces in which they operate. So, yeah. so thank you, Greg. I, and that was a really interesting discussion. It was a really interesting part of our project that you've 
contributed to. And I think the presentation that you've made is, is excellent. So I would absolutely drive people to, to go and have a look at that. So thank you very much. At that point, I'll, I'll say goodbye, unless there was any parting uh, note that you wanted to say, Greg. No, just uh, thank you for inviting us in. It's always great to give, be given a challenge. Um, but again, as you say, when we went through the process, that we realised that you know there's a lot of things that we could deploy. And you're right. Sometimes you have to take a disruptor approach to to to, to break through. And I think this uh, opportunity that you've outlined is something that would definitely work in your marketplace and should be tested. So thank you for inviting us in. It's been a great uh, project and uh, nice spending time with everyone this morning. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.